one. Welcome to A Professor's Life, your weekly podcast for all things academia. I'm Chris. With me tonight is Stephen. Hello, all. And Robert. Hello. All right. And we are going to be talking today about conferences, which I think is probably one of the best parts of being a professor is going to conferences. For sure. For sure. It's a new chance to get someone else to pay for your travel. Yes, that <laughs> is why way. it's the best. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think all of us at one point in our career have uh, done the junk it <laughs> trip or the uh, the trip of like, hey, I didn't really have to go to City X, but... For it's in Paris. Yes. It's the only possible venue for my, my research. Right, right. So, all right. So, Stephen, you've been to a lot of conferences as of late. At sure. least that's... Yes, so... What would you like to say about, since you're so recently experienced with conferencing? Recently experienced conferencing. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, it's nice as those were, in the last, I guess, six weeks or so, I went to two different conferences that were about as different as possible. Uh, in July, I went to a very small conference. There's about 250 people. That's what they capped it at. Um, so it was, it was all in one topic area. So I do a lot of research in groups and teams. And so this was really in that area. Everybody was a groups and teams person. Now it was multidisciplinary. They came from business and psychology, communications, et cetera. Uh, but they all had one specific focus. And so we could, anywhere that I walked to, any person I talked to, they knew what I did. I knew what they did. It was very easy to fall into conversations about what we did, uh, which was nice. So it was a really from a, a research collaboration or exchange ideas or hanging out with people that you actually know, this was a great situation for that. Well, the, uh, can we back up a little? No. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. I think we should start with why would you even go in the first place? Oh, awful good conference. question. Because oh. doc students, I've been getting some weird questions from doc students lately about the importance of a conference attendance. Uh, okay. So sometimes... I know, at least for you, the, the reason I'm bringing this up is we're a fairly effective networker, um, and you're at the part of your career where I know you're going. You're not going just to give a paper. Hmm. So, and I'm thinking if we have, you know, a lot of doc students listening, they're probably wondering why should I even go to a conference in the first place? How do I pick which ones to go? You know, why do academics even go to these things if it's not to give a paper? Well, okay, so that was what I wanted to compare and contrast, but I think that's a good good idea here. Um, so, so the other conference, let me just say that, and then I think that will make sense yep. of, of this point. Right. The other conference is our massive academy conference. There's 19,000 members of the academy, 11,000 people went to this conference. So you either have one conference of 250 people, but all doing the same thing, or 11,000 people who have uh, the good chance that they have no overlap have, with anything that you do other than you are both in the field of business-ish. Because actually they have a pretty much uh, a lot broader than that, actually, in many respects. Um, as I've, I've been going to conferences since I was a first-year grad student. Uh, and for me, it always is about getting to see people, getting to know people in one venue or another. So I'd go to these large conferences, and when you have 11,000 people running around and you are a first-year or second-year doc student, it's probably fairly intimidating. And for me, it probably was, uh, if I can remember back to that many years ago experience. But... I was able to, you know, use my own personal network in terms of the department, of my mentors, um, other doctoral students who were ahead of me, and basically meet a couple people, right? So you go to a conference of 10,000 people, and you meet some people, you go to a session maybe that you're interested in, uh, you go to, they always have doctoral student consortiums uh, in different forms, and you meet some people. My goal in all these things was always to, hey, you know, I'm going to meet a lot of people, say hello to a lot of people, but if I can come out of this with you know, a handful of people that I will even remember who they are the next year, that's a big win, right? Come out with five people, I've got something. The next year, those five people plus another five or ten people, because those five people, I'm going to say, hey, how are we going? Oh, you're talking to Bob over here. Hi, Bob. And that's a nice little uh, extra person that gets picked up. And over time, that builds and that builds and that builds and such that, you know, I was walking through the streets of Vancouver and I couldn't go more than, you know, 30 seconds without seeing somebody that I knew. And that's with 11,000 people there. So for me, a lot of this was getting to know people, getting to find people to hang out with, people that I could turn into collaborations. So I've, I've gotten collaborations out of this. It's a place for collaborations that I've had ongoing to be in the same place at the same time. So we move forward projects. Um, but it's also just generally 
get to know somebody in the field. So you're not just sort of this insular spot of it's the people that I work with every day and that's who I ever see. Uh, so that's a lot of what I'm looking for. Now, there's additional piece you can add on top, which I think you're also implying in there, Robert, which is, hey, maybe you actually want to get something out of this in terms of substantive. Uh, there are sessions, there are PDWs, so you can go there and learn an actual skill. So maybe uh, a lot of places learn how to run an analysis or run a, uh, uh, use a tool or something like that. Um, you want to learn about a specific theory, you have a place to pick that up. Um, there's a lot of those substantive pieces, but for me, I don't tend to find that nearly as interesting at this point in my career because what I get out of a 10-minute presentation is generally not very much. Uh, I'd rather learn, read the paper. If it looks interesting, I'll send a note to the to the authors and ask them to send the paper to me, and then I'll get more out of it. So for me, a lot of it is going to the to the conference and seeing people. I'll hang out in the lobby of a, one of the conference hotels. Anyone actually attends a paper session? Yeah, people do attend the paper sessions. I was in... Why? I mean, what do they get out of it? I mean, it's essentially just people reading their abstract at you. I, I think people are getting slightly better at this, I hope. I don't know, the sessions I've been in have been slightly better recently. So I went to two sessions at, at this most recent conference, and um, both rooms were full. Uh, I convinced one of the symposia uh, panel, uh, the, the person who put the thing to hold together, to eschew the idea of a normal paper presentation. So we actually all each had, all the six presenters had, uh, I think, seven minutes to present something, just our thoughts. And then we spent 45 minutes as a group with a Q&A with the audience. So really, it was a discussion. Symposium? I'm talking about the pure paper sessions. Yeah. You know, pure papers. If you, what do you get? Four minutes? Five? No, you'll, you'll generally have 10 minutes. Oh. You'll usually yeah. have 10 minutes. It I mean, back. it's different in the sciences. Um, it's, it's a poster session. Yeah, reading papers is just not what we do. Uh, it, you know, you're presenting work that you've done up to that point. It might be in a published paper, and you might be advertising the paper, uh, but it's not. I, I have no experience in like um, humanities conferences, obviously, because I'm not in the humanities. But what I hear my humanities colleagues tell me is like, what goes on their conferences seems like it's quite a bit different than what goes on mine in the sessions. You know, there's the short talks, there's the longer talks, and there's tutorials. Uh, and so I find the short sessions to be um, very useful in identifying papers I want to read further. And they're generally worthwhile going to, even if they are short, as long as you go to the right ones. Mm -hmm. Right? So the ones that are, are aligned with your particular subfield. You know, if I go to that, then I get a lot out of those 10-minute talks. If I shop around, I don't get much out of the 10-minute talks because I don't know enough about the jargon of that particular subfield to get a lot out of it. It's too, it's too condensed at that point. It's like a research talk, right? But if I go to like one of the 20 or 25 minute talks, I would get more out of that because they're a little bit uh, longer. They take their time going through things a little bit more. Um, so yeah, I, 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 our sessions are always, I, I don't want to say full, but there's always people at all the sessions. Um, there's not like a, I don't know. It's, it, it seems like, it sounds like it's different to me than what you guys are going through. Again, a lot of this is a size question. How big yeah. are we talking about? Um, so conferences that I go to, there's one that I go to regularly that's small, say less than 200 people. Mm -hmm. And then there's another one that I go to um, that's less frequently held, but it's more than 500, but not quite 1,000. Right. So those are still a lot smaller, a lot more personal. Yeah, yeah I don't go to like the March meeting or the April meeting, which are like thousands yeah. of people. Yeah. Um, I just don't like that big of a conference. I prefer smaller, more sort of focused on my field mm -hmm. kind of things. I think, again, that's the big difference. Yeah. I think some of it for some people, though, there are a lot of schools that won't pay for you to go unless you're giving a paper. Oh, I don't go if I'm not giving, presenting. Okay. That's a personal rule. That's just a personal rule, though. Um, go to conferences anymore that require me to submit a paper because I don't want to submit a paper. I want to go and learn stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, which is why I don't go to the academy much anymore because one, I'm not a super networker like Steven is. Um, I mean, the last conference I, I was at and saw him, I mean, it was, it was amazing watching him work. He was very good at it. Um, I tend to be a little quieter, uh, listen to people a little more kind of thing. So it's usually three, four times I've been at a conference where I start to learn the different groups. 
Uh, I also like to try to avoid the academic politics, and it's so easy to step into these groups that are in blood feuds with other groups. And I just find that so boring. Um, so I don't do that anymore. But um, there are a lot of good conferences out there, like uh, the GCEC, the Global Consortium of Entrepreneurship Centers, where technically people give a paper. They set that up for the people that can only get it paid if they're giving a paper. Um, so they submit them and they go through kind of a peer reviewed process and then they're kind of part of a session, but no one wants to hear anything about your paper. Uh, it's more like what you describe in your conferences, Chris, and people just want to talk about topics and what's interesting going on. Anything that's actually been written down is, you know, kind of been done to death and they're a little bored. Um, and then I just went to Nerdtacular, uh, was, was an awesome conference that had about 700 people, um, just purely for the networking. It was an excellent networking opportunity. And then I've done some uh, regional academic conferences, which have been really good. The smaller ones where people don't pontificate quite as much. Um, I may be a little down on the academy because the last time I went and opened my mouth, I was encouraged uh, not to attend again <laughs> um, by someone who started reading their resume at me and their response. And, and uh, it was over venture capitalists and they set up this paper and I had point one, so I got a little pissy about their p-value after they got nasty with me but I asked them if they ever, ever talked to a venture capitalist and they said no why would I this is what the literature shows and they said well then the literature is all bogus crap <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're saying that's what the literature shows uh, and then they did the whoa when I was at Columbia and I said wow was everybody there that big a moron but I never was there um, yeah I was encouraged not, not to come to sessions anymore. Um, but I just don't have a lot of tolerance for that. I think some of it is being influenced. There's a, an academic in my field. His name is Bill Starbuck. Uh, and he's gotten fairly famous as a curmudgeon railing against significance testing and the bogus nature of what we publish in journals. Uh, and I really like him. Uh, so some of that could have rubbed off on me. But I, I don't go in trying to be an ass. I mean, I actually want to learn something from that paper. Um, but I'm right. also, you know, not going to be a doormat. Alright, well see again, that's that's the question of what what's the goal of this? And academy management is not about the give and take on papers for the most part. You can get to workshop levels of these things, you can get to panel discussions where you can get those things, but I think most of the people who are there for just paper submissions, they're there because of the funding issues. So those things are just run through really quickly without a lot of depth in it. You have to get to something smaller, which is why I say I go to a 250-person conference if I want to get content. You know, then we can exchange ideas. You know, I have the mid-level conference of 5,000 people, and I have the big conference of 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the mid-level conference has gotten too big for me, though, and so I stopped going to that one a couple of years ago because when I started, it was 2,000. When I started the Academy, it was only, you know, 7,000 or 8,000. So it just keeps getting, these keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So mm -hmm. it's you're sort of pricing yourself out of value. Yeah, I guess I go for. We have some pure internet conferences now. Hmm. Yeah, um, which I like the idea of. You know, it saves you the travel costs and the hotel and all this for if you don't have a lot of money. But they're still doing the give a paper for papers sake, which means you aren't learning a damn thing. Right. Um. So it's just that, that aspect of conferences when they try to pretend that it's a conveyance of knowledge. I mean, if, you've, if you're jaded enough or you've seen enough, uh, then you know you're not going to get anything out of that. But I still hear people telling doctoral students they need to go to these things because they're going to learn. Uh, you're not going to learn a damn thing. You go to their network. Well, you can learn. You can you learn. learn. Yeah. Paper session. I think it, you can in a PDW or a workshop or a symposium. Um, but, but I still hear people encouraging people to go to paper sessions. Well, you can be very creative if you want to. And so, again, this is the difference with a social science versus sort of a hard science. You can have a really good idea and do it exceptionally poorly and present that. And people would say, that's an interesting idea, and that's it. And that probably never gets in. You, but they could get into a conference. It can't get into a journal, but it gets into a conference. I know people who have gone to those sessions saw the interesting idea presented by a person who didn't know how to do research, went back and said, I can do that better and do this because there's a place for it. There's still a place in the space. And so if you want to take this in a very instrumental way, 
you can go and basically troll for ideas. If you are a mid level, a mid doctoral, mid doctoral program, doctoral student, if you want to get an idea for a dissertation or an idea for another paper, this is a way you can do it. Yeah, um, it's not what I do, but I, it's a way I can see people. On their limited, they get to go to one conference, kind of funding to waste their time doing that. Now, I don't mean the doctoral consortiums; those things. No, no, I meant you go, you go to an actual paper. You can, you can pull it off. Don't you think you'd be better off sending them to a smaller, more specialized conference? Well, we, we, we fund ours for two right now so yeah well, we can only do one unless one of us unless a professor specifically sends the student mm -hmm. but there's only enough funding for one conference and they tend to send them to the academy yeah uh, and I, I just advocate they spend all the time at the consortiums and the, the pdws because mm. uh, they just don't have enough time i think to go properly troll for ideas anyway yeah well that's that's the thing you have to be really good about some of that stuff you know and then a lot of times at least what i've liked best when i've seen uh doctoral students at conferences hopefully their chair or mentor is shepherding them around mm -hmm. showing them how to do a conference yeah you know introduce them to places where they're uh, potential landing places for jobs and these kinds of things so mm -hmm. i don't tend to see that as much as i'd like yeah because you hope that Maybe when the application comes in, they'll get a second look, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to immediately get turfed. Because uh, you got to have some way to screen so people just, yeah. how many pubs do they have? Okay, now I'll look more. Uh, yeah. I go, my goals for going to a conference, and maybe this will help the doctoral students that are listening, uh, are several. And many of them are overlap with what Stephen does. The networking, you know, looking for new collaborators. But I also go to learn because I don't have time to page through all the journals that are out there in physics, mm -hmm. right? There's too many. And so I go, I browse the topics that are, you know, the talks. I go to the talks to identify what's interesting, what's new out there that people are working on. Um, so that helps me sort of learn what is, you know, what are trends in my field. And then I can go chase those papers down, whatever. Um, and then on, in addition to that, I go to share my work. And this is why I don't go to conferences unless I'm presenting. Because one of my major goals is to share what is it I'm working on right now and get feedback from people in a way I can't. Because I'm at a small institution, mm -hmm. there's nobody there that does anything like what I do. Right. Right. So I have to go to these conferences, share my work so I can get some feedback and say, you know, is this, what do you guys think? Is this the right track, wrong track, whatever the case might be? Or can you recommend another path to go down? Um, and sometimes they just lead to collaborations. Sometimes they just lead to very interesting conversations. But uh, those are sort of the reasons why I go, and I think they're valuable. I don't really I, – no, I guess that's true. I do go to network, but I'm not an a active network as I, a networker as I think Stephen probably is. I'm I could be this, better. I'm getting this attitude that I'm this apparently this networker guy. but Dude, you're good at it. Um, but I, I think, Chris, you've also narrowed down the, the scope of the conference as you go to to be very specific to what you're passionate about yes you're not going to physics conferences right you know, right you go yeah. to uh, they're almost all nonlinear dynamics right yeah ex almost exclusively i haven't been to a non nonlinear dynamics conference <laughs> uh since graduate school i went to two plasma physics conferences in graduate school uh just because it was somewhat related to what i was doing and uh but yeah, uh, no, I purposely only go to uh, stuff related to nonlinear dynamics. Yeah, so I, I think I've had similar exposure to you. I like going to the specialty conferences. I go to entrepreneurship conferences or venture finance conferences. Those are the people doing the interesting work where they don't seem to have the, you know, their heads up their ass. Right. Um, and are really interested in, you know, hey, this is what's going on in the field right now. You know, what are you doing that's interesting? See, yeah. I, I, I think you'll find the same people who may come off like they have heads up their butts in the big conference. They'll be at the small conference. But the difference is you can't pull the wool over people's eyes in that very narrow space. Right. So I've seen papers that are best paper uh, winners at the big conference that I've read them. And they're just – they're written by people who have much broader vocabulary than I do. But there's <laughs> nothing in it. And yeah, so when you have 10,000 people at the conference and you have, you know, have to be reviewed and eventually they get, they go from, I've had people who have been, you know, friends who are chairs of these, these, uh, 
divisions for the conferences. They say, you know, first they send it off to the reviewers that are on the editorial boards of the good journals. Then they send it off to reviewers that they have published in places. And then they send it off to reviewers to people who are at institutions they've heard of. And then they send it off to reviewers of institutions that they've never heard of. And then they send it to people at countries they haven't heard of. And then they send it off to doctoral students in countries that they've never heard of. Yeah. You know, and those people... With the pulse. Right. And, and so at that point, you know, you get maybe impressed with opaque, mm -hmm. you know, but when you get down to, you know, nonlinear dynamics conference, everybody there is an expert on nonlinear dynamics, which means they're not going to just, you know, you can't just hand wave. Right. You actually have to have the content and same thing with, you know, groups and team stuff. You, you have to know the content. And so when you're in the room, you're not BSing anybody. If you do, everybody in the room is be like, no, that's stupid. And we're like, oh, okay, you're right. It's fine. Right. Moving on. Right. Yeah. That said, I, I would like to, maybe the next time the March meeting comes around to the East Coast, I don't want to spend too much money to go to a March meeting, but uh, I wouldn't mind going. It's a, it's a very large physics, and it's a general physics conference, and I wouldn't mind actually at some point dropping in on one change of pace and also just see how it's changed, because it's been a while since I've been to that meeting, and just to see you know what's going on now, how are these things sort of run now, and... Uh, you know, man, get a chance to drink with some more interesting people that I don't normally drink with at conferences. Because that's another key thing about going to a conference is hanging out at the hotel bar <laughs> or the conference bar or whatever, uh, whatever it is. Rooms, yeah. It's quite a bit of science that gets done at those bars. Yeah. Back of the napkin uh, calculations, as it were. And it's Well, they call it back of the envelope calculations. But, yeah, the premise holds. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I don't know. Um this may not have been the best time to actually first have this topic. I mean, I just read the paper that, what was it, 85% of all social science uh, publications since 2004 can't be replicated. And a giant group went out and tried to replicate a bunch of uh, social psychology and psychology studies. Couldn't replicate their findings at all. I mean, not even in the ballpark. Uh, and when they could, effect sizes were always quite a bit less than were being reported in the journals. It's just like, it just makes you a little jaded. Well, and I think uh, I think Nature, if I remember correctly, has actually started uh, talking about these kinds of things in the sciences as well. Um, what? But here's the thing, and I don't want to get too far from the topic of conferences, but. When you're under the pressure to publish at a particular rate to get that tenure, get that promotion, get that grant, whatever the case, whatever your goal is, this is, this is going to happen because you, you're going to put stuff out as quickly as you can so you can get that next thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, that's why we're having journal and even and conference proliferation. Yes. I mean, there are so damn many conferences. Oh, my yeah. God. There's one got to be one every day. Uh, I mean, I'm just I'm not talking just business conferences mm -hmm. uh, hundreds per month and then there's all kinds of supposedly peer-reviewed journals which for 500 bucks you know i can get your napkin published uh, that's a pretty good deal because like some of the ones that i hear the open source journals and physics are like yeah two grand or something like that mm. 500 bucks that's not bad yeah well we could start one tomorrow one day, <laughs> publish some crap. But, yeah I'll publish whatever you want <laughs> we'll have we'll call it uh Crap that couldn't get in anywhere else journal. <laughs> well, this is why, like, Retraction Watch is an interesting blog to follow to see all the stuff that people start catching. You know, mm -hmm. the, the mass set of journals that were recently caught where um, authors were actually having their friends or themselves serving as the reviewers of their own papers uh, right. Right. by fake emails and all that stuff. So that's, that's stuff that goes on. It's, it's a story for another day. Yeah. Um, but it... But, yeah, so I, but I'd really advocate, at least if you've never done the conference game, um, specialty conferences are awesome. You get to really, really know people. Uh, um, probably more likely to, to get really good connections for jobs or collaboration or find other people that are really into whatever you're into. Not great for crossing boundaries, you know, getting and bringing in people from other fields or getting diverse ideas. But I think a really good place to start or like Chris does when you got to leverage yourself because Nobody in your department has a clue what you do, or nobody in the entire college has a clue what you do. Well, anybody in the region, um, you know, you pick something like that. You you, you got to find people to work with. 
you know, or you're going to just talk to yourself and go crazy. Right. Um, uh, so I think that those are great, but it's just some of these generalized conferences that are just becoming these big behemoths, uh, you know, where people have their little sweetheart deals and are getting their buddies in and this kind of stuff. It's just getting a little old. And um, I'd like to see more, us push more to people into conferences where they could actually, you know, learn things, particularly our students, you know, because they can already get what we all know at one particular institution, but they aren't getting any diversity of ideas. I mean, we're people that have self-selected or all think we're all equally awesome uh, and our way is the way. But, you know, um, just think of trying to learn a, a weird statistical technique. Unless your particular narrow program happens to have it, you're kind of screwed if you really want someone to give you some decent mentoring. Uh, and a conference seems to be the, the easy place to go and find someone who might be interested. Because I still think, as much as a lot of my colleagues drive me crazy who just don't give a crap about their, their students, um, I think there's a lot of us who still do and you know, would contribute whatever little bit of skill we do have. Um, to people. Uh, I sat down with, this, with a doc student yesterday and uh, very quickly discovered that he does not want to be a research academic and he is terrified to let his chair or anybody else know because we don't, you know, we, we don't train people to be consultants or want to go to, you know, balanced schools. You must go to a research one and get tenure or you suck. You know, you will damage my career kind of a thing. I was like, whatever. It's this kid's life. Uh, so I gave him advice of, you know, this is what you tell your chair. Okay, now this is what you actually do. You know, for getting to go on the market and looking around for the kind of jobs he's actually interested in. Yeah. Because I've seen that every place I've ever been, there have been professors telling their students that they should go to places because of how it reflected on their chair or their committee, not because it's what the student wanted to do with their life. Uh, and I think that starts with conferences, but conferences you encourage these people to go to, especially if you have extra funds to send them, because uh, most of these kids don't have a lot of funds. So that are they're really, really dumb because <laughs> they shouldn't be going into this. If they if you're independently wealthy, go sculpt, man. Well, you know, um, I think it's important to, as you mentioned earlier, to mentor students going into conferences. And how do you do it properly? One of the nice things I've seen um, SIAM do as of late, SIAM is the Society of Industrial and Applied Mathematics. And um, they actually, mm -hmm. before their conferences, have a uh, paper or PDF that they send to people and say, how, you know, what do you do at a conference? Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, how do you do it? And, and basically, they talk about, you know, uh, six months out, you know, when you first register, you first submit your abstract, whatever the case might be, all the way up to like during the conference. It's like, you know, when should ha you have your talk done? What you should you do with like business cards that you get? You know, what should you do a day before your conference and, and all these things? And you shouldn't be finishing your slides on the airplane. You know, these kinds of, uh, of course, we're all guilty of that, but all <laughs> these kinds of like, you know, I, and I thought it was a really nice guide. And I thought to myself, boy, when I was a student, I, did not know of that. Mm -hmm. I, it might have existed. I just wasn't aware of it. Oh, and that's it cool. would have been helpful. It's just yeah. a conference primer. Yep. Yeah, it's a conference primer put out by the society that's putting out the conference and just a great way for uh, a young person to take as get as much advantage out of that conference as possible. Mm -hmm. I bet you that our survey satisfaction on the conference has gone way the hell up too. Mm -hmm. I, I, maybe. I don't know. Um, it's not something I really follow, but I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. That's clever. That's a good idea. So, so uh, Stephen, do you have more to contribute? No, I'm good. I don't know why he doesn't think he's good. He's very good. <laughs> well, I think I have uh, talked about as much as I can say about conferences, at go. least for now. Yeah, I kind of killed the mood. <laughs> All right. So thanks to Robert for killing the uh, topic tonight. Um, it's, it's okay. It's his job. Uh, <laughs> if you liked it, say you liked it. If you got annoyed, yes. send hate mail to Robert. Yes, right. If you did like what you hear, or at least up to before Robert's rant, uh, please click subscribe <laughs> or like the video. Leave us a comment. Um, let us know what you think of Robert's rant 
or the rest of the show. Uh, otherwise, uh, we're going to wrap this show up tonight and everybody can get back to writing. <laughs>